On Friday, March the 7th, 1941, the most well-known of all the raids on the town took place where Ransom and Miles' factory was bombed. The type of work carried out at the factory made it an obvious target for the Germans. The raid commenced at about 1.40 p.m. Many workers were returning from their lunch break when the alert sounded at 1.35 p.m. A few minutes later, a single German Heinkel III bomber, flying so low that those on the ground could see its markings, approached from the south, following the railway line. As it neared Ransom and Miles, it was fired on from several different points, but still managed to drop four high-explosive bombs. Two of these landed in the works, one on the side of the road by the factory, and the other on an air raid shelter adjacent to Stanley Street. The plane also machined on the site before surfing, passing over the factory again and dropping another bomb. Fortunately, this one did not explode. According to German reports, the aircraft flew over for a third time in order to take photographs. The all clear was sounded and rescue parties went immediately into action. Various ambulances transported casualties to hospital. And the Home Guard helped to close the roads around the works. The first aid posts and the Women's Voluntary Service Canteen were also kept busy. At 2.24 p.m., the alert sounded again. Another enemy aircraft approached and dropped five more bombs, but only one exploded. This was near the road and caused more damage and casualties, many of those hurt being rescue workers. The all clear was sounded again at 2.51 p.m. As a result of the raid, 30 men and 10 women were killed. One young woman was never found and was presumed dead. Among those killed was a young woman who had planned to get married the following weekend and a man who had recently been discharged from the office. 65 people were admitted to New York Hospital and a hundred more were treated at the works own underground hospital. Well, that's the English again. This is the German. Flying low, the aeroplane of Premier Lieutenant Nantz passed over England. He said there was panic on the roads and in the villages when the plane suddenly appearing out of the clouds was made out to be a German one. People ran into houses and motor car drivers leapt out of their cars and hid in ditches. Flying fields were crossed and the aeroplane stationed there attacked with weapons carried on board before the anti-aircraft artillery broke up and became dangerous. The railway line down there must lead to the factory. There it was, only one kilometre away from the plane's course. Five bombs hit workshops and railway sidings. There was great excitement on the factory premises. Hundreds of workmen left the buildings in panic and tried to reach shelter. The anti-aircraft artillery sent up a fairy rain of coloured tracer ammunition. Machine guns in the aeroplane spluttered and sent their bursts into the anti-aircraft artillery positions. Amidst a terrible fire, Zouts risked flying over the premises a third time. Photographs were taken. It was uncanny to see the effect of the bombs. Our four bombs dropped, the first and second exploded, almost in the centre of the factory premises. The last two destroyed two large workshop buildings completely and damaged further the building. Of two workshops, only the foundation walls remained standing. Suddenly, there was a noise in the aeroplane. The defence became dangerous. So, up into the clouds. That's the German account of what happened. As Tom said, on that day I was sitting under the stairs with my mother, where Dad had told us to go if there was a raid, get under the stairs. Still there, only a year ago, the lady still living at number three Sleaford Road asked me back. And it's still just the same as it was with the electricity box on the left hand side. I remember sitting under there and hearing the machine gunning as they went over our house and hit the roof. And when the all clear sounded, Mum and I went down the drive and looked up the road, Sleaford Road, towards the railway bridge. And there was all the smoke coming over and the workers coming home. 
A gentleman I remember until he died, lived in Penta Buildings, took my hand and my mum and took us back into the house and told us to stay there. And of course in the evening, father and dad not having come home, I was allowed to stay up. And I remember lying on the settee with an ivy down over me. And at half past ten there was a tap on the window. People did that if we knew them and they were coming to the back door. And I remember getting up and running thinking it was my dad. And it wasn't, it was my cousin Sid Vance. And he'd come to see us. The next thing and the last thing I remember was on the Monday morning, sitting on a settee in the lounge when Superintendent Millhouse, in all his finery as police superintendent, stood on the left hand side of our fireplace, my mum on the right, and they obviously spoke. And my mum broke down. And I understand now that that was to come and report that they had finally found some remains of the fire. Because he and his friends in the tool room decided it was safer to go under the steel marking table than run out across the open to the peripheral air raid shelters. And they went under the table and it got the direct hit. Bert Emerson, who's still alive and was in the raid, he told me only a year or two ago that um, when he was one of the first people into the tool room after the raid, what was left of it, and he said it was just full of poppy parts. So that fits in again with what my mum told me many years later when I'd grown up. She said, your dad's coffin was very small. And that's re the reason why. Oh well, thank you very much.